Chapter 64 Dharamsala, India Michael It took me a week, but I managed to purchase a passport from America to India. I did not know what to expect when I got there. The plane flight took 11 hours and during those hours I was reading Mary's diary. Daniel had managed to conceive the picture that Bishop Bergstrom had of Mary, him, Mother Harper and him as a two years old child. I stared at Mary's image for so long as I was on my way to who she was. I would read some more of the pages and it was strange of how she wrote of where she was from. She even wrote of how to get there. It was as if she knew that either Daniel or I would one day want to go there. Mary Veyu was born and raised in Dharamsala, India, which is a part of northern India. Dharamsala is located in the Kangra Valley within the Dalatar Mountains. It had become the capital of the Kangra district in the year 1852. It was only accessible through the Panthakot that is only 120 kilometers away. I was to learn that the nearest railway to Dharamsala was Kangra. The nearest airport was Gaggal in Kangra which was just 15 kilometers from Dharamsala. I had to take a flight to Delhi and from there take the train to the valley. The train ride was very pleasant. I don't believe I ever seen such beauty in mountains as I seen there. There was snow on top of the mountains, but the weather was very comfortable. It was kind of a cool feeling in the air. I stopped and rented a small room in a motel in the middle of the, I would say, downtown area. After I settled myself in I had began to walk the streets in search of Mary's family with the address I had from the diary but did not have a clue to where I was going. I walked for almost two hours until I kindly asked a man coming out of a food market where I was. I needed to understand where I was first before I could start in any direction. He took the time to explain to me where I was. I asked him of where I had to go in terms of the address. He gave me directions there and he pointed up towards the mountain. She lived in the upper level of Dharmasala. I looked up towards where he was pointing and saw that it would be a long walk. The road had disappeared into the fog that was along the side of the mountain. I began to walk upwards the valley's steep roads. I walked for about two more hours carrying my backpack full of things until I came upon a man sitting by way of the road dressed in an orange robe type garment on a concrete slab with a small shack looking shelter behind him. I sought to ask him about the address and suddenly two wild dogs were walking down the road saw me, they began to growl at me. I stopped in my tracks as they were coming closer and suddenly the man in orange said something in another language and they walk in another direction. I thanked him and afterwards I slowly walked across the road trail towards him as he was still sitting. He was an older man with white hair that peeked from up under his hood. He had very rough looking skin and he had one eye that looked as if he a fully developed cataract. I reached into my pocket and showed him the address I wrote down out of Mary's diary. He looked up at me and asked me, you are American? I told him yes. He took the address in his hand and told me that it would be another 45 minutes to an hour walk up the mountain until I reach a part that leveled out into a home setting that resembled a farm. I thanked him and walked further. After another hour, more than what he had said, I came upon the setting that he spoke of. There was a small home there and yes there was much land there for farming. I walked over towards the house. As I was walking towards the home, I looked around and again noticed the beauty of the land. I thought of her and how very humble she was and realized that our surroundings have everything to do with our state of being. I could not understand why she would have wanted to leave such a beautiful place. Once I reached the home, I knocked on the door but did not get an answer. I knocked three more times but still did not get an answer. I afterwards walk around the side to the back of the home and looked into the field and saw a man working. He looked as if he was manually plowing the field with a pickaxe looking tool. I took a deep breath and started to walk in his direction. As I got closer, he saw me and stopped working. I slowly walked up to him as he stood still with his tool still in his hand. I walked until I stood not far from him as we look into one another's eyes. 
I looked and was shocked, he was an amazing resemblance of Daniel. I thought, this has to be Mary's father. Mary looked very much as her father and by her having a male child, he would be born looking as the grandfather. I remember his name from the diary as, Gabriel. Gabriel? Gabriel Veu? He looked confused for a moment and then he looked as though something came to him within. He looked away towards the road that lead from the home and said. No one has walked upon that road for years searching for me. Nor have I walked upon it to leave this place that I created for my dwelling, a dwelling of emptiness. He looked at me with a very sad but humble eyes. But, there is one who stands before me whom my eyes have never beheld. Have you come to bring me more sadness or have you come to deliver me from my grave? I was confused in what he was saying to me. And suddenly Brother John's words came to me, never allow anyone to bury themselves in a grave. We must help those see that there is still life inside them, no matter what they feel. I placed my bag down on the ground, unzipped it and reached into it and revealed the picture of Mary with Daniel, Bishop Benjamin Bergstrom and Mother Elizabeth Harper. He took it in his hand slowly and looked at it. He took a deep breath and then closed his eyes. It looked as if he was in pain. He looked at me. For many sunrises has this very day and moment lived within me. It has been a time in which I pleaded for and yet grieved. My dear wife should have lived to live to see this day, it would have put her mind and soul at ease. But because of the author of this, she also died because of it. I told him that I had many things to tell him. He placed down his gardening tool in the field and asked me to come inside the home. After we entered the home, Gabriel began to make some tea. He asked me to sit in the living room while he prepared the tea. I walked into the living room and sat down. After he came with the tea and sat down, I nervously told him who I was and what I became to marry. It took me about two hours to tell him all of what happened to her and also Daniel including where I was a fault at and that I had in my possession their remains. He sat very still and humbly and listened to me attentively and I had noticed that he had shed no tears of Mary and her death. After I finished, he told me that he understood everything but he said that he was more at fault than anyone of what happened including things that transpired in America. I was surprised and also confused to hear that. I knew of Mary mentioning in the diary that her family rejected her for her becoming Catholic. I questioned him on what was said by Mary to see if it was true. He suddenly rose from the couch and walked outside. I followed him. We walked in silence along the land of the home until we came upon a pond that was not too far from the open field he was working in when I came. It was very beautiful. There was much greenery and there was a very pleasant cool wind blowing from the top of the snowy mountain that surrounded the valley. I was able to see a reflection of the mountain on the pond. I thought to myself, who would want to leave such beauty? We stood there for a minute. I began to feel uncomfortable and so I took the intuitive to open a dialogue. Sir, I just want to tell you that I am sorry for everything that happened to Mary and Daniel. I know this hurts you. I have been in pain since all of this has happened. I just wanted to do what Mary wanted. She wanted to come home. I did not feel that it was respectable of her life or memory for her to be left in a country that treated her so cruelly. Countries don't treat people with cruelty, Michael. Isn't it the people that make the country? Gabriel looked towards the mountain and then around at the pond and the other beauty of nature while he spoke. God created all of what you behold. God gave us the land for a dwelling place until we join with God. The country, the land is but kind to us. It gives us what we need to live and to survive. But, there are those who live in this dwelling place who are not one with the nature of things. We become something other than what we are a part of and we become lost. In becoming lost, we cause others to be the same through our choices. Gabriel bowed down and picked up a stone and then tossed it into the middle of the pond. The stone caused ripples and as they were moving outwards he spoke as he pointed. 
observe of how the ripples move outwards abroad the pond. Before the stone was thrown into the placid pond, nature was at peace. But because of what I a human being chose to do with the stone, there is now conflict. And it is spreading out and will affect the rest of the placidity. I looked at what he was asking me to see. What we choose to do not only affect us, Michael but it affects all that are a part of our lives and the lives of those who we do not know for generations. You wonder of your eyes of why I shed no tears. I looked him in his eyes to imply a yes. For many years I knew that Mary was never coming back here. I knew because of what I had become a part of since the time I knew myself existed. I don't understand I responded. He then looked over at me into my eyes I will tell you what happened. When Mary decided she was leaving here I was against it. She said that she wanted to go to America to start a new life. She said that she felt as a prisoner living here. She did not agree with many of the Hindu traditions. She said to her mother as Myra and also her sister Melinda that she wanted to get away from the discord of the Hindu and the Buddhist and venture her mind out into something else that would give her the humility that her life had been missing for so many years. In Hinduism it is taught that if you are born into a poor family, it is due to something that we have done in our past life in which warranted us this lot. Mary did not believe this to be true. She saw this to be unjust and a thinking of men who are lost in superstition. Mary felt and believed that God would not punish us for sins that we consciously are not aware of. She felt that Hinduism was giving a false character of God and that we were telling of a God of no compassion or understanding created by the minds of men. She said that she wanted freedom from tradition as many say this day. I felt her to be of that rebellious generation because of my dedication to tradition. She stopped going to Hindu services and it caused conflict between her and I. The morning she left here I was angry that she would defy my wishes. And then when we received a letter from her eight months later after her departure that she was becoming Catholic and was forever rejecting Hinduism, I ordered the rest of the family to not accept her anymore. This reminded me of the incompatibility of my father and I of when I decided to be a priest until he understood. I also felt a sense of imprisonment and a weight upon my mind and heart of choosing to detach myself from the wishes of my elders over my life. In my wanting humility in my life as well. That I too was to be looked upon as a rebellious child simply because I had the freedom of a choice over a life that only God gave me and no one else. To also walk away from generations of repeated pointless monotony. There was a pause in his telling me everything. He looked up towards the top of the mountain and then around it saying, I told us saying this to no longer accept or to love her daughter. I told a sister to no longer love and to accept her sister. After a time after Mary was no longer here, my wife grew distant from all of us. She would cry of Mary at nights, as she would sleep. As Mary did about me as she wrote in her diary. I would try to comfort her, after the coldness of the dominating and dictating. Dot stubborn spirit relinquished enough for I to be moved by her tears. I would later think of my actions in trying to do that and thought in questioning myself of where did I conceive this sense of consciousness that would have me to think, to believe that what I did was right in terms of my disowning my own daughter. He looked over at me in my eyes as if he knew that I had the answer and I did. But I did not want to assume that I did. What kind of human being could do this? God did not intend for any of us to treat our children as this. I was to realize that what was causing this within me, was what Mary said she wanted to get away from and to be free from. It was tradition and the influence of tradition forced upon the senses of the mind from thinking logically. It was the fundamentals that were traditionally passed unto me that caused this. It caused a lack of understanding and dominance within me, from a lack of mercy in care to listening. Religion and tradition is what caused all of this inside me Michael and it reflected in the way I treated my family. I saw Gabriel as my father was, but my father was never human enough to admit his flaws. It caused me to realize that I knew not myself and therefore. My family. 
I realized for so many years that my family loved an illusion of a human being. I am deeply ashamed and have for years asked God of why I am still living. For this state of living is but a feeling of suffering and death to me. And there are none of my Hindu brothers, who contain the words to diminish the things that I see in my mind of what I have done or to cleanse away the inner pain of the words that I spoke and until this day here in my own mind. Gabriel began to weep. I did not know what to do at that moment. I just stood still and listened. After being broken hearten of Mary and her life my dear wife is Myra, she became sick. Bedridden after a couple of years of traumatic stress. She suffered this because of my holding on to tradition. I held on to tradition and at the same, letting go of my wife, my family. Mary. I looked at him very intently and I could feel that something was coming that would tell me of why he was there alone. There was a painful pause in him, a pause even I was able to feel in which caused in me a sense of fear and anticipation. After a time my wife as Myra died. She died a morning when it was raining. Mary's sister Melinda, was by the bedside when she spoke her last word. Her last word was the name of, Mary. I saw Melinda's eye as she looked at me. There was so much hurt present. After she passed on, I walked outside the house into the rain to this very place I am standing with you this moment. I observed how the rain was softly falling into the pond causing the pond to look as if it was alive and speaking to the other parts of nature. After an hour Melinda came outside and stood next to me. I thought she would comfort me at that time, but she as I, looked into the pond and suddenly said to me, you killed my mother as you forced desolation upon Mary's life and killed my sister. I looked over at her in shock that she would say that to me. I until this day remember her eyes as they penetrated my very soul along with her last words to me. Melinda told him, for years we have shown you nothing but love. For years as your wife as your children we have shown you nothing less than honor and respect. We upheld the integrity of this family as your daughters and as my mother did as your loving and caring wife. But, this day I see now that what you have always known of us was death, because this is where I see this path has ended. And if this is where this path ends, it reveals the course of the path from the beginning. What you and my mother gave life to for so many years, did you return of those times of blessings from God, death? I want to know why you, my father, killed my mother and my sister? I was not able to look at her nor was I able to answer her. I was only able to see the sadness of the rain penetrate the water of the pond internally paralyzed by this moment. And then she said. Melinda said to him, you were never a father to us. You are nothing less than a murderer, a murderer of the worst kind, a man who is nothing but a coward who killed his wife and daughters. I'm leaving this place. I understand now, that this was never my home. Nor was it the home of my mother or my sister. She walked away from me and back into the home. I stood by this pond for two hours thinking and weeping. I looked and saw my daughter walking down the very path you came, the very same path I saw Mary walk when she left. I never saw her again since that day. Not even at her mother's funeral. Did she come? What he told me was painful and then he said to me. Michael, I told you this truth to tell you that you are not carrying the burden of Mary's death alone, or my grandson's death alone. She wrote and told us she was with child and despite what was written. Dot my wife and daughter wanted her to return here. It was I alone who did not allow this to manifest. Had she been able to come here with Daniel the both of them would be living and maybe the path that you walk towards this home would be time's order. To see your true wife and son. I listened to him and still heard words that carried with them death and not life in terms of moving forwards. Regardless of what could have been, it was not our reality. I was to realize the next morning what was and what could be. I understood his pain but it helped me to realize that my journey to India was also the same as his. It was a journey of forgiveness and reconciliation, a gift and opportunity from God. 
It could have ended there at that pond where it had began for him but I knew that God was inspiring me to come there for a greater purpose than our internal pains, which are in truth trivial in nature. And a much greater purpose than I had anticipated was flowering before my eyes and my being led there to the father of Mary. It was early and so I offered to join him in the fields. As I was doing the work he instructed me to do, my mind began to think of so many things. I was working in the same land that Mary worked in and yet, I thought that I am in the same position as this man because of what I did to her. We were both responsible for what happened to both Mary and Daniel and there we were, working the same land. I thought, is this what this is supposed to manifest to? Are we subject to this land because of our abominations against those who we were supposed to love and protect? I also felt the sense of emptiness and loneliness he was feeling that enslaved him to that home and inspired him to not leave it for seven years. I knew that, that was not my lot in India. This had to mean something more than these thoughts that were rooted in fear and guilt. After two hours of working the field, I looked to see of how he was doing and did not see him. I looked around and saw him standing at the pond again. And I suddenly saw that beautiful pond as an agency of misery and sorrow, considering of what Melinda said to him of his wife, her mother. And who was I to stand there to allow him to bath in that if things were to ever flower into something more meaningful? I needed to find out who I truly was that moment because something had suddenly died in me as something had implied that it needed to come to birth. Was I cold and callous as those before me? Or was I a caring and loving, compassionate man? I felt something become a part of me that was original. It has always been inside of me. A love and concern not dictated by my parents or even the church. I had witnessed a moment of clarity that was moving and growing inside. I humbly embraced it. It was beauty, it was love. There was a feeling of love inside that transmitted to my mind that I was present for a far better purpose than him remaining as he was and as I was. I suddenly realized that if I allow this to continue in joining him in his sorrow in becoming my own as well, then we would never be free of what has been done in the truest sense. The real beauty of the pawn needed to be internally restored so that it can be seen in its true beauty and not as an object of a scorched past. I slowly walked over to him. I was silent for a few seconds. I looked at him as he was looking into the pond and Mother Harper's words came to me for that very moment. And so I spoke them. In the memory, in the grief that has been inflicted or even self-inflicted and also left behind without resolve, that act, in its essence has a mystical power to rob one of the beauty that resolve has been created to offer. Resolve all things in your life. It is the first and best real step to freedom and into real growth. There was a silence. A stillness that seemed to be a pivotal point. I was hoping that he was feeling the need to go forwards. It was so needed. Sir, I understand all of what you have told me. But, we can't allow this to bury what is left of what life remains of this family. Despite what happened, I am now a part of this family. We must go and reconcile ourselves with God by finding Melinda and reconciling our differences. There must be forgiveness and a healing. Come on sir, please. We must not allow the enemy of all of us win. I feel as though we have given him enough power through our own ignorance, our own selfishness, guilt and pain. Yes, sir, in which roots in more areas in our lives than we may ever know. But, we can put forth the effort to end the power of the enemy with forgiveness and reconciliation between all of us. Please sir our lack of effort only gives power to that which has destroyed the people who we loved. Gabriel looked into my eyes. Come on, sir let's go and find your daughter and reconcile so that God will pour life back into our lives. We cannot give up this way. Sir as we stand before this great land that will in time bring forth a harvest of God's generosity, there must be a harvest for us in our efforts to reconcile our differences. I know that, this is what is Myra and Mary would have wanted. Gabriel stared at me in a surprising but humble manner. 
He nodded his head and then slightly smiled at me. We started to walk back to the home. We decided to leave early in the morning. We needed time to inquire of where Melinda was living. But that night with Gabriel I will forever treasure. We sat outside that evening on the side of the home facing the pond and the mountain. The moon was out that evening as well as the stars. And the light of the moon was reflecting against the snow on the surrounding mountain. There was a steady cool wind blowing. We talked of the beauty of the heavens and the language of the wind and the coolness of it. We for after a while felt that everything would be okay. It was a night that I never wanted to become a memory that I would miss when it reflected within my mind causing a feeling of sadness. I wanted it to last for eternity. We understood that where there is dying, is there but life persisting into possible fruition as long as we do what is right to preserve what life is left in what is still living and yet dying, as a wounded plant. We came to understand that dying implies something in the process of dying, rather it be a person or a situation, the process still implicates, life. Dying means that there is still life persisting. Death we came to understand that death in its true essence is when there are no more issues to reconcile. He thanked me for coming to bring closure and also a beginning to this most sensitive and yet complicated dilemma. That night on the side of the home before God and God's magnificent creation we prayed together. A Hindu and a Catholic praying together realizing that through trials, we are fighting the same enemy. I thought of Bishop Bergstrom and his personal account that he shared with Daniel in the Sahara Desert praying with the Muslims while in a trial. It is true that religion only separates us and it is trials as these in which shatters the religious disposition and bonds men and women together as one under the one and true God. It is what God intended from the beginning and therefore the trial period takes us through the affects of past actions and back to the original principle of oneness. That night I slept in their home, and I was given Mary's room to sleep in. I found myself touching the walls and even smelling the sheets that were left on her bed trying to in some manner reconnect with her. After Gabriel went to sleep, I walked around the home looking as if to almost try to feel the presence of Mary upon the truth that she had graced those very floors, those same walls. I also felt a sense of guilt and shame in knowing that where I am residing is a place of where Daniel could have grown up. Yes, a place where he was denied because his mother was denied. Gabriel detracting omitted this and I, Daniel never had the opportunity to see the beautiful mountains and valleys of Dharamsala India. He never had the chance to see his grandmother, his grandfather, or his aunt. And he never had the chance to sit or stand at the pond and converse with his grandfather as I have, to pray with him as I have or to love him as I have grown to love him. My feeling this told me that Melinda still loved her father. It was the affects of the past in which held her in bondage as well. It prevented her from walking back up the same path she left to reconcile with her father. She too as well as all of us, needed reconciliation and forgiveness into freedom. Chapter 65 Inspiration from Mary The time by my watch was approximately 3.41 am in the morning. I guess as I talk of this now that considering the urgency and importance of my reasoning or should I say, purpose, of being there, I saw setting my watch to India's time held very little if any meaning. As I was lying sleeping I suddenly was awakened out of my sleep by a voice that seemed to be Mary's. I recall kind of tossing in my sleep not for a long length of time, but for only a while not long before I was awakened. I was not dreaming in the common sense of the meaning, but I was hearing voices and seeing slight visuals while I was still within the sleeping mode. I would be conscious of my moving and in the same time remembering that fact that I was sleeping and struggling to remain sleep and also for some mysterious reason, I felt within a visual sense that Mary was in the room with me. I was sleeping in the room that Mary occupied. I recall smelling the sheets that were upon her bed. Not in a manner of perversion, but I just needed to remember her body scent. I wondered if there was any of her left alive that I was able to recognize. I was suddenly made realized of how much I desired her presence. My dedication was terribly misguided. 
It was misguided by my feeling the strong need to please my elders while Mary spoke of us having a family in assertion that she would please me in a manner that was most needed. I failed her. And in failing her I failed myself and created a monster of my now deceased son. I was under tremendous pressure and yet I had a sense of hope present inside telling me that matters are going to be resolved. Matters will be made to rest as well as being the birth of something that will involve a great pain in growth. I was hearing someone in between consciousness and sleeping calling my name. Suddenly as I was within the midst of coming physically conscious I heard Mary's voice, Michael. I instantly woke up in a very conscious state. I sat up slowly and was looking around the room. I thought that maybe Gabriel was calling my and my mind had altered his voice into Mary's, but that was not the case. I was feeling a beautiful presence about me. It felt as love was in the same room with me. The room was lighted with moonlight and shadows that were moving upon the walls because of the wind outside the home moving the trees. I was suddenly inspired to go outside. It was uncharacteristic of me to venture outside in the night, but it was as if I could feel someone's hand take my own and leading me to a place sacred and yet, very familiar. As I opened the front door of the home I saw the beauty of the night sky. Being within the mountains of Dharamsala India one can see the night stars very clearly. There were white clouds in the sky, the wind was blowing in a steady but pleasant pace. As I stood there looking at the beauty of everything, again I could feel some presence lead me to the area upon the side of the home of where the high grass and the pond resided. The mountain was partly caressed with the light of the moon. Even the stars seemed to have given off their light, and then it happened. I stood still to see the beauty of everything moving together in harmony and suddenly I felt a great joy inside. I was overtaken with joy I had begun to laugh out loud and cry. I saw Mary in all of the beauty made revealed to my eyes and she lived in all of this. I felt her in the wind, I saw her in the night sky and the beautiful stars. I saw the true beauty of Mary. The wind was blowing the high grass softly as the moonlight was glowing upon the grass as it moved. The pound was gentle trembling with ripples from the wind and I could hear Mary's voice in everything, I could feel her presence in all things moving and living. She was a part of all things living and moving as I finally realized that it was indeed Mary's voice that I heard who woke me from my sleep. It was her hand in which guided me from her room and outside. It was she who walked me to the side of the home so that I was able to witness all of what helped her to be the beautiful soul she was and is. I felt such an immense love in this moment. I felt that I was loved by her. She still loved me. She embraced me. I remained still with my heart and mind open to make certain that I was completely in the moment as I knew that what I was seeing, Feeling and learning was something very sacred and yet new to my very being in giving me strength and guidance. She touched me in all of this and was showing me a part of her that, had I not rejected her, she would have been able to share with me, but still she had found a way to touch my spirit with such of that beauty, that grace and compassion she had desperately desired to give me. Her spirit was inspiration. She was sent to inspire me to move forwards towards something of great substance. After a few moments, I suddenly felt a sadness. A sadness because in her now showing this all to me inwardly as well as outwards, the conflict that I had of living of both worlds, she would have showed me that our world would never have been as others before my eyes nor her own. As Bishop Isaac's parents resolved their situation, I suddenly understood of how ours would have been made possible had I never been made to feel that my parents would have strongly rejected her, in fear of them disowning me. In that moment it was very easy for to blame my parents, but blame them would not be practical despite their social standing. I had made up in my mind to become a priest suddenly without a fear of their non-consent, I thought of why had I not had this courage in those times of Mary. The truth of Bishop Isaac's words of my needing to forgive myself was before the path I was getting prepared to journey. This moment in harmony with his words was explaining to me that Mary had already forgiven me. It was now a time to forgive myself. I marveled at the sight as suddenly my thoughts and feelings were weighed towards the house for to rest. 
I said to Mary, thank you. Did you